a wounded soul. Right? Somebody hurt you a long time ago, and maybe you respond and react. Let me say this way. Maybe if you grew up in a home that was abusive, you're, there was a wound in your soul, and you respond and react that way through your life. You carry this thing on. When I'm with me saying this, you're not under any generational curses. Matter of fact, let's raise our hands up real quick. You can close your eyes so you, don't, you can't tell your neighbors looking at you. And I want you to repeat after me. I am not under any generational curses. I am not under any generational curses. They were both broken in the body of Christ. Just because my grandpa had diabetes doesn't mean I have diabetes. Just because my whole family were alcoholics doesn't mean that I'm an alcoholic. Amen. I want you guys to listen. I, I hear that type of language in the church all the time. You know, so and so, my whole, my whole family said cancer, so I'm going to get cancer. You know, the Bible talks about there's life and death in, in what we speak, right? And I think what we miss in the church, I think what's happened to the church is we become so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm saying carnal, not necessarily sin focused, but carnal minded is it. We don't uh, realize that the battle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against spirit, spiritual uh, high principalities, Ephesians 6. Amen. And we, so we begin to respond and fight with a carnal mind because we don't understand that we're not, let me say, if I fight, uh, if my brother here cusses, goes around cussing me out, stuff like that, and I'm angry at him, then I miss what the Bible is trying to teach me. Right? That I pray for him because the influence that's causing him to do this is a spiritual influence that's speaking into his life. And, and I'm not saying that he, he submitted to that. Right? I'm not saying that he doesn't take any responsibility in that. We don't blame everything. Well, the devil told me to do it, so I just did it. But I, that's not what I'm saying here. But I'm saying that sometimes people are, you know, the church is full of gossip, envy, jealousies, uh, because... And, and then all it does is brood more gossip, envy, jealousies. And because of that, we begin to uh, fight each other versus realizing that we're really on the same team fighting the devil, right? So it's important, just because we're moving on from healing our souls, doesn't mean that you need to say, okay, that part's over, right? If there's still restoration healing needs to go on inside of you, you need to keep this. This thing might take for years for you to really open up every door, be ready to open up every door. Just because we're not teaching it, because we're moving on to a different direction, doesn't mean that you just stop. Continue to let God work in your life and heal you and restore you. Because what we're going to talk about today is about authority in our life. And the, the deal is, is, if I am still wounded in my soul, I, I, there's areas in my life that I have submitted authority, that I've given up authority. If, if, if I'm allowed to be controlled, if somebody hurt me a long time ago and I'm holding on to unforgiveness, that part of my life I have given up authority over. I have actually submitted authority. Put it this way. There's two kingdoms, right? There's kingdom of light there's a kingdom of dark. I'm either submitted to the kingdom of light who says forgive, Right? I will help you forgive. I will heal. Or I'm submitted to the kingdom of dark, which says, that, hey, don't forgive. You keep holding on. You keep being mad at that person. Right? Whatever kingdom, king's domain that I'm under is my influence. This makes sense? Okay, I'm probably getting out of my notes a little bit, but that's okay. I, 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 you know, the Lord, when He established man on the earth, Genesis 128 says, that he gave dominion over everything, right? Actually, he gave. He didn't say he gave dominion if you fast and pray. He didn't say he gave dominion if you do this or do that or whatever. He just gave unconditional dominion to man over the earth, unconditionally. Amen. Right? But here comes the enemy sneaking in, and Satan at this time had a limited. He was an angel, had limited authority. And what he did was is Adam and Eve submitted to his authority. And when they submitted to his authority, they actually gave their authority to him. Amen. When Jesus was on the Mount of Transfigure, or not the Mount when he went to the mountain to pray, 40 days, fasted and prayed, it says that the enemy came to him and says, if you will worship me, what did Satan want? Satan wanted to be worshipped. 
He says, if you'll worship me, if you'll give me what I want, I'll give you the kingdoms. I'll give you the authority. And, and of course, Jesus did. Actually, Jesus tricked him into it later on and took the authority without uh, anything the enemy making any bargains or negotiation. Don't negotiate with the devil. Right? Don't agree to anything. And see, if you say, if you agree to a little bit of strife in your home, uh, I think it's James 3 says that wherever there's uh, envy and strife and confusion, that there's every evil working in that place. So when you agree, hey, this little bit of strife is just normal. What you're doing is, is you're negotiating with the devil saying, yeah, we're children of God, but we're going to come to agreement with what you say. And what you say is, is that strife and envy is okay in my life. Now let me say this real quick. I'm getting ahead of myself, but I want to lay this foundation before I go. The Apostle Paul said that the foundation of Jesus, that he has laid the foundation of Jesus, and that we can build upon that foundation. So everything that I'm saying today is built upon the foundation of what Jesus has already accomplished. Right? You are in right standing with God right now because of what Jesus done. If you fail in every area of your life, it will not remove you out of the right standing with God. So what I'm talking to you today about is not about how you become right with God. And I'm talking to you today and probably the next few weeks about how to restore authority in your home, in your lives, in your businesses, in your finances. Hopefully through these teachings you will learn how to stop working for money and to let money begin to work for you. Amen? So everything that I'm telling you is not a work that's going to get you any better favor with God. Okay? And, and, and as long as we understand that it, it, even, no matter what this sounds like, because I'm going to tell you some things that you need to do, that what I'm telling you has nothing to do about you and your relationship with God. Jesus sealed the deal. It's a done deal. If you're in Christ, your relationship with God is not... It, uh, 2 Corinthians 5 said he is not imputing your trespasses anymore and, and uh, Andrew the other night said that uh, you better hope he paid for your future sins because he said he died once for all and if he did pay for your future once he's not coming back going to pay for you. we're all done we're all toast so uh, the, the failures in your life is not going to be separate you from God it doesn't keep God's favor from moving on your behalf and matter of fact the, the word says that it rains on the just and the unjust, okay? So God doesn't just pour blessings out on the just. It says that it, He pours blessings out on unbelievers. Pastor, I'm sorry to interrupt. Amen. We're just talking about victory in our life. Right? Yes. Living the abundant life, okay? Romans 5, 17. So I'm going to lay, what I'm going to do here is, and I'm going to let her, I'm going to go through a bunch of scripture if you, you don't have to follow along. If you want to write it down, or, or, I'll give them most of them to Macy, so hopefully... Uh, she can try to keep up. <clears throat> but, but, but go back to what I was saying. What I want you to understand is, is that we're building on the foundation of the finished work. I'm going to say this. The church has, has built on a foundation, let's say a, a, a teaching of repentance that is not based on what's already happened, right? And this is why so many have not experienced victory because they misunderstand repentance. They were still living under it. Old Testament idea of what repentance is versus a New Testament idea. And so that was not built on the finished work of Jesus. That was built on an idea of religion. So what we're building here is everything that I'm talking about today that we do is that is what Christ has already accomplished on our, on our behalf and He has empowered us. I'm gonna say, let me say this real quick. I'm so excited about this. I, I've been on this since Monday. been on this since before that, but I really began preparing for this Monday. And man, my wife's heard me preach this about 50 times on the way to church this morning. And I was, and, and this is why I was worried about my notes because as I'm preaching to her on the way to church this morning, I was adding stuff to it. And I was like, man, I didn't put that in my notes. What am I going to do? And I was like, well, I got to have to trust God. <laughs> but I want you to understand something. Uh, Adam and Eve was given authority, right, dominion. But even as a New Testament, they still didn't have something a New Testament believer had. Jesus said that he gave his uh, disciples authority, and then he tells them after the death, burial, and resurrection, he says, go away to Jerusalem so that you can receive power. Do you understand there's a difference in authority and power? I'm going to read this to you real quick. This is from the Thayer, and it says, uh, authority, the 
the power of choice, liberty of doing as one pleases, leave or per permission, physical and mental power, the ability with strength one is endured, which he either possesses or exercises, the power of authority, influence, and right, the power of rule or government, the power of him who wills and commands must be submitted by others. That's the long thing. I want you to focus on this. The power of choice, liberty of doing as one pleases. What did Jesus come to do? Come to set us free. Right? That we are in the liberty of Christ. And now you have the authority in your life to be to live free. Free from condemnation. Free from guilt. Free from the law. Free from expectations. Free from what other people say about you. You now have that authority in your life. What's it? Let's go to power real quick. Power is the strength, the ability. Uh, I'm going to just read the first one. And this is from the thing. Inher inherent power, power residing in a thing by virtue or nature, or which a person or a thing exerts a per or puts forth. There's a lot of other things of power. So listen, authority gives us the ability to leave, live freely, right? Power gives us the ability to maintain that authority. I can... I can have authority. I can speak to the demonic realm, but without power, they're not going to listen to me. All right. All right. Hallelujah. I want you to understand something. Uh, Romans 5.17 says this. It says, For if by one man's offense reign, death reign through the one, how much more those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in this life through the one. So this is saying, the word reign is rule, it is authority, it is that I will be able to reign in my life. Through what? Through the gift of righteousness. What's the gift of righteousness? Righteousness. That I, the gift of being in right standing with God. That when I understand that I'm in right standing with God, I can reign and rule in my life. That God is not for me, but God is against me. God is not working in my favor, in my life based on my marriage, but He's working in my life based on Jesus' marriage. And it says to receive the abundance of grace. What is grace? Grace is the ability to, what does Titus say? To, uh, to walk godly, to deny all ungodliness. It's the ability to, to fulfill what God wants you to do in your life. Okay? It's power. Grace is power. Grace is rest. Grace is Jesus. Grace, we can go on and on with that. But, you know, what I understand, what I see in the grace movement, the grace revolution, I want to say grace movement, grace revolution, is a lot of people understand unconditional forgiveness and unconditional love, but they still have not begun to walk in victory. When I, when I, when I understood... When I got this revelation, when the Lord began to show me these things, I was like, man, this is the thing that's going to open up the church, and it has. It has changed lives. Uh, you know, I'm going to tell you that this grace, uh, the gospel of grace, has been so powerful. It's literally sweeping across the nation, and it's changing lives, and it's, it, it, it is the most powerful thing that's happened to the church. But I still see people that have an understanding of this, and they're still walking defeated. One, I think, because they they have it here, but they haven't experienced it. Amen. Right? They're still they still feel like there's something that they man. I just gotta I just gotta dig one more well, or I gotta go through one more trench, and if I open that well up, this is gonna happen. And they've missed it. They've missed it. The well, every well was popped open through Christ. Right? Every trench was dug clean through Christ. And 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 the, the harder you dig, and the more you push the further you're going to get from it because God's not uh, wanting your, 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 your efforts aren't even required. They're not even desired. God's not interested in all the things that you can do to manifest the kingdom. He's interested in what Jesus did to manifest the kingdom. Okay. Kind of got her off a little bit, but that's okay. Uh, Romans 6.16 says this. This is what this is. This is kind of the emphasis of what I want to talk to today. And this is kind of redundant. I went over this a little bit last time. But it's okay to be redundant because I want us to get it. Right? Amen. The faith comes by hearing. Hearing the Word of God. It's not. Just because you ate a cheeseburger last week doesn't mean you're not going to eat another one. Just because you heard a message last week doesn't mean you don't need to hear it again and again and again until it begins to build your faith in that area. 
It says this, it says, Do you not know to whom you present yourself slaves to obey? You are that one slave whom you obey, whether, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. Actually, Daniel was talking to me Wednesday about uh, that you can't be an authority unless you're submitted to authority. Right? I, I can't be... And some of you might say, well, Brother Bill, you're, you own a construction business. You're not under anybody's authority. Wrong. I'm one under God's authority. Right? And how I operate, how I make decisions, I begin to think, Lord, how do I do this? What's the right way? What's biblical? But second, I work for people. I work for tons of people. And I'm under their authority. And the guys that work for me are under my authority. And, and some of them, some of them are still young guys that are just partying, but some of them are authority in their homes. And, and so I cannot come in, I cannot be an authority to those guys unless I'm willing to be submitted to authority. And this is what this is saying. This is saying, Romans 6, 16, who you submit yourself, who you yield yourself to to bay is who you're serving. You're going to be a servant of that. If there's two kingdoms, if I submit myself to living a life of sin, whether the blood of Jesus has taken me, whether you are in Christ and Jesus has dealt with all that, I have literally yielded my authority as a believer because I have submitted to the dominion of darkness. Does this make sense? I'll give you an example. If I have nothing wrong with righteous anger, but if I have an anger that's not righteous and I lose control, right? I am coming into an agreement with an entity that's not God. Right? And I'm not, and I'm not, I have, I, that area of my life I have not authority in. There's something else controls me. And, I, and for some reason I feel like that if I agree with the devil that, that this is the way to get authority, then I will actually have authority. But what happens is I truly lose my authority because I'm submitted to the wrong authority. Hallelujah. One thing we need to understand about God's kingdom is it operates different than this one. In God's kingdom, you rest so that you can work. And in, in this kingdom, we work so that we can rest. And in God's kingdom, you receive. You give to receive. Right? God's kingdom gives, you give, you receive. Here you work or take so you can receive. You understand that God is a giver. Amen. The devil is just a taker. He has created nothing. Now all he wants to do is come take everything that God has created for himself. That's why he wants you, because he wants to take you for himself. When we become givers, not through guilt and condemnation, not that if I don't give, God's going to make me sick and take it to my doctor bills, none of that junk. But when we become givers, we literally align with God's kingdom. And instead of the enemy having authority over our finances, we begin to take authority back over our finances because we align with what God says. We're operating out of His dominion. And I'm not just talking about giving to church. I'm not taking up a second offering either. So God is a giver. When, as we become children of God and then we receive that gift of righteousness and when our identity begins to rest in the one, then we begin to be givers of our time, of ourself, of our finances, of everything because we are representing another kingdom. In God's kingdom... You believe so the veil can be removed. See, here we always think we're from the show me state. Show me and I'll believe. God says believe and I'll show you. Everything is flip flop. Right? When we want to talk about bringing God's kingdom to this earth, we're going to have to look first off begin to throw away the way we think government should be ran, the way our businesses should be ran, the way everything is done in this kingdom, and we're going to have to throw it away because when God's kingdom manifests on earth, we're going to do things the way he does things. We're going to operate out of giving to receive. We're going to begin to believe to see. And everything that we do is going to line up with what God does. Right? And the deal is, is it doesn't make any sense to us how this works. But the, but the truth of it is, is we've been running government systems for a long time and they fail and they fail and they fail because they don't, even though we say we trust in God, we don't operate in the way that God operates. Right? Because the way God operates doesn't make a bit of sense. That, that lady was here, Kim, where it says, God will tell you to do things that you can't believe. The devil will tell you to do things that you can't believe. 
When we truly, I, I believe in the kingdom, the heaven manifesting on earth and those things. But when we talk about the kingdom manifesting on earth, we're literally talking about the king's domain. And when his, when his kingdom manifests here, we're going to operate from the way he operates. And it's not going to make sense, but it'll begin to operate smoothly and governments will fall and fail like they have before. Okay. I've said a lot to get to this. Uh, let's go to Galatians 5, 19 through 21. Hallelujah. You guys stay with me. I'm going to make this, I've kind of bounced around a little bit, but that's okay. Shakalaka. I'm going to stay in this for a while because I, I just to feel like, you know, what Andrew said the other night, he says, I meditate on things for three or four years before I teach them. Well, you guys aren't that lucky. <laughs> you, get to, you get to go through it as I go through it, right? As, as the Lord's ministered to me, this is what's coming to church on Sunday. Uh, I, I've been in ministry for less than four years, so it's going to be difficult. And the things I was preaching four years ago, I wouldn't preach now. <laughs> I know all you guys would preach what you preached four years ago, but not me. Anyway, hey, uh, did you find it? Okay. It says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fortification, uncleanness, lasciviousness. Here are 20. Idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. So this is the works, if you put that in context, this is the work of being under the law. But I want to, you know, the proverb says that if you keep your heart with all diligence, or he says keep your heart with all diligence because the issues of life spring out of this. And so this is what I'm talking about, your healing in your soul, that when you have been wounded, these very words that he's talking about here will be the very things that you're going to manifest. Ambitions, selfish ambitions, drunkenness, revelries. But it says this, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's a scary passage, huh? It's like, whoa, 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 whoa God's going to send us to hell. No, that's not what that's saying. Not at all. Matter of fact, Jesus says that those who uh, teach others to break the law will be the least in the kingdom of heaven. I'm not going to preach that today because I'll get thrown out, but I'm going to give you what kingdom here means. Let me back up a minute. 1 Corinthians 6.11 says, it, it kind of leads in the same way. Don't, don't be deceived, those who practice drug release, road release, all these different bad things. He says, well, I'm here at the kingdom. He says, and some of you were, but you were washed, you were justified, and you were sanctified by the word of our God and by the spirit of our God. Right? So you are no longer these things anymore. You are now a washed, not by your efforts. You are justified, not by your justified, never sinned, not by your efforts, and you are sanctified. You are set apart for God because of what he did, not because of what you did. But... Actually, Scott has shared this with me and it brought me to a different revelation of this. It says, this is the theater. It says, kingdom. It says, will not inherit the kingdom. Kingdom is royal power, kingship, dominion, rule, not to be confused with an actual kingdom, but rather the right or authority to rule over a kingdom. Amen. He's saying, listen, if you want to practice these things, don't be deceived. You're not going to inherit it. The kingdom. You're not going to inherit the authority. And you say, well, I thought God gave us all things. He did give us all things. But the Romans 6 is that whoever we submit ourselves is who we're a servant to. So is, if I go out and sin after church, is God going to strike me down? Absolutely not. He, he dealt with that on the cross. Okay? This isn't about my relationship with God. This is about my relationship here on earth, the dominion that was given to us. Jesus says that all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me as a son. So as a son, I have all authority in heaven and earth. But if I submit myself to another dominion, if I set my, submit myself to another kingdom, then I am under that kingdom's rule. I become that kingdom's servant. And I've lost the authority in my life. Amen. Right? I've lost the authority to uh, rule and reign in my life. When you say, well, brother, it says that it's the gift of righteousness and the abundance of grace. Yes, but the gift of righteousness is going to teach us to walk away from these things. Amen. Right? Hallelujah. And when I begin to walk away from these things, I begin to experience kingdom rule, kingdom ideas. 
you know, we were talking about giving a while ago, and uh, a lot of grace people are really coming against giving. And I, here's what happens is, is the enemy likes to do this. The enemy likes to abuse something in the church, and then we get hurt. And then we, even though it's a biblical truth, giving is a biblical truth, the enemy likes to abuse it through people, right? We don't battle against flesh and blood. Abuse it through people, people that we trust, and then we begin to be offended by truth. And this is what happens with prophecy. A lot of pe people who abuse prophecy, didn't have an understanding of prophecy, begin to prophesy, Brother Joey, God told me if you didn't straighten up, he's going to send you straight to hell. And then Joey feels like this tall, and prophecy is about edifying and building up. And so what happens is, is once somebody's been wounded in their soul from somebody they trust, they no longer want nothing to do with it, even though it's a powerful truth in the church. You know, the devil doesn't counterfeit anything that doesn't have value. Yes. Giving has value, so the devil counterfeits it with a lie. Prophecy has value, the devil counterfeits it with a lie. You don't see anybody on earth counterfeiting pennies. Because there's no value in that. Right? Hallelujah. I'm sorry I'm teaching today. I know some of you guys would rather be just like... Come on, Pastor, let's just shout Shaka Bonky and inject each other in the temple with some glory and uh, roll on the floor for a little bit, but I, I feel like God wants us to do this. <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay. Here's, here's where I'm going to. So the Apostle Paul writes basically, if we if we actually submit our authority to living in another kingdom, we're not going to have authority over our lives. We're not going to have authority over our finances. Everything in the kingdom is about submitting authority. Me, as a husband, to my wife, I submit to Christ. right? And if I will operate my household how Christ tells me to operate my household, then what's God's kingdom of? The, king, the kingdom of God is not about eating and drinking, but about joy, peace, and righteousness. Right? If I submit my self to him and that my wife biblically submits herself to me then my home will operate from that kingdom principle joy, peace and righteousness Amen. if I'm operating out of strife, battling and confusion, God is not a God of confusion but of peace so we're operating out of the wrong one and I think sometimes, I'm going to show this to men in here today, sometimes we sit back on the back stool and don't say nothing, don't say nothing, and one day we just stand up and say, you need to get this house taken care of, blah, 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 blah. And then we go back to not taking authority, being submissive. That's not, a, that's, not a, that's not being submitted to the kingdom. That's not being submitted to Christ. You are the one that operates your family. This isn't, this isn't beating your wife down. This isn't a uh, against women. I, I respect and honor women completely. This has nothing to do with that. This has to do with God's kingdom. God created you in a certain way. And because He created you this way, He knows how things need to operate so that you can have authority in your life. Amen. Right? Sometimes we don't want to do things. It's like, God says, shout to the Lord. And we're like, oh, I just, I'm just not a shouter. Well, the reason He tells you to shout is because he, He's the one that created you and He knows the victory that comes in your life when you shout to the Lord. Right? So sometimes you got to do things you don't feel like doing, but it's for your benefit. Shaka laka. Okay. Uh, I'm going to read my note here and then we'll go on. Adam lost authority when he submitted to the wrong authority. Likewise, in your life, you are stripped of authority when you submit to the wrong authority. Amen. Okay. God is not wanting. This is. Let me say this. The, the church has missed what God's problem with sin has been from the beginning of time. It wasn't that he had a problem with sin or a problem with you. This is what we thought. God has a problem with me, right? And then when and God's relationship is based on how good I can be, how morally I can be getting it right. And what we missed is, is God's problem with sin from the beginning had nothing to do with you. God's problem with sin from the beginning because He knew that it destroyed you. He knew that it raped and molested His children. God hated sin. His wrath is just an, is, is, our John Crowder teaches us the other day, His wrath is just an extension of His love because His wrath came to eradicate sin itself. Amen. Right? 
So here it gives us the Holy Spirit. He removes our sin nature from us. We no longer have a nature of sin. You might be trying to still defeat that thing, but I'm telling you, if you're still trying to put to death your sin nature, you're fighting, you're shadow boxing a defeated foe. Your sin nature has been defeated. Will you be tempted? The Bible says that you will be tempted, but it says that God will not allow more temptation than you can handle. And James says that if you will submit yourself to God and resist the devil, then he will flee from you. If you will submit to the right authority and you will and resist him trying to bring you to his authority, that he will run from you as fast as he can get away from you. Why? Well, I'll show you with you here in a minute. John 14, 30, Jesus says, I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming, and he has nothing in me. You understand why Jesus walked in authority? Because he did not have, the devil had no claim, had no right to anything in Christ, period. Amen. That's why when he spoke to things, they had to listen. Because he was, he says, I only do what I hear my father do. I am in my father's king's, I'm in the king's domain, and I'm going to operate out of that place. And as I operate out of that place, I have authority on this earth. Mark 5, 7. I'm going to do a little backtrack on Mark. This has been a very powerful scripture to me. Mark is where the man is in the tombstones. You guys know, most of you know this scripture. The man is in the tombstones. He's beating himself. He's cutting himself. The tombstones, if you look it up, it's a monument of remembrance. He's in a place. This is what religion will do to you. Every shortcoming you have, it will begin. It will not let you forget it because it wants you to remember it. Because as long as you remember everything that's wrong with you, you'll never walk in authority because you'll never be worthy of it. Right? So the enemy likes to keep us in this monument of remembrance of everything that's bad. You ever listen to a, when the microphone, uh, if it comes out and, and it goes right back in the speaker, comes back out, the sound that it puts out, the yes. So this is what we are like, right? When we're in this monument of remembering everything bad in our life, we, we, we put out, what we put out is a bad sound, a bad smell, right? Listen, the blood wasn't just shed for the forgiveness of your sins. Hebrews says that the blood was shed to cleanse you from a guilty conscience. You're not, God doesn't even want you to feel guilty. Right? Guilt works for a season, man, but love never fails. I, I used to preach that all the time, and that is the absolute truth that we will be set free. So this, this dude's running around, cutting himself. He's in the tombs, the tombstones. And Jesus comes to him and he says, he cried out. This is Mark 5, 7. He cried out with a loud voice and says, What have I to do with thee, Jesus? He recognized that there was nothing in Jesus' life that they have anything. There are two completely different kingdoms. There are two completely different domains. And, they, and the, the Spirit says, What do I have to do with you? And he says, don't torment me, please. And then he said, don't send me to the abyss, send me to the pigs. All right? And even the pigs were smart enough to go run and kill themselves. <laughs> Hallelujah. Why is this? Even the spiritual realm recognized that there was nothing in Jesus that they could lay claim to. There was nothing in Christ that they could... Uh, that they could attach to. There was no, he is not ever, he had never submitted himself to the dominion of, of the devil that he could ever be attached to. I'm going to share this and then we're going to shut up, okay? Uh, 2 Corinthians 2 14 through 16. I know this is a lot of scripture, but this is the Apostle Paul writing to the church of Corinthians. He says, Now thanks be to God who leads us in a triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance. Of his knowledge in every place. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one we are the aroma of death leading to death, and to the, to the other aroma of life leading to life, who is sufficient for these things. Will you go to 16? Are you, in the, are you go to 2 Corinthians? Yeah. 12, 14 through 16. Hmm. Is 
Well, two, Second Corinthians two. Hallelujah. We praise God for Macy because all of our staff booth people are gone today, <laughs> and she was like figuring this out on the fly before church. So, uh, she's super cool, and she's super cool. And we got to train somebody else because she's leaving, going to college. You know, all these kids think they need to go move off somewhere and go jump on a plane and fly around the world and go to college and. Like the rest of us doesn't matter anymore. Verse 16. It says, To the one, to who? To the enemy, we are the Savior of death unto death, and to the other, the Savior of life unto life. The Savior is a smell. This is, I don't know if I'm saying that right, but it is an aroma. It's, a, it's the smell, right? And when we have, well, let me put it this way. When, G, when they accused Jesus of casting out demons in the name of Beelzebub, yes, it's, that, that means the Lord of Flies. You know what that means? So here's what I'm going to share with you today, guys. I'm going to say this again because I don't want us to miss this part. Between you and God, you're in right standing. Nothing you can do can separate that. Other. You can reject Him, but, but your failures and your shortcomings are not going to separate you from God. Jesus made this union. He says, yeah, I am with the Father and you're with me. This is not talking about your life with God or God's favor on your life. This is talking about your life on earth and living life and life more abundantly. Taking authority over your communities, over your homes, over your jobs. And that as, as you know, Adam walked and, and gold would manifest at his feet, that things would come to you instead of you going to get it. Learning to work from a place of rest. This is what this is about. Right? When I submit myself to God and the fullness of everything He's asked me to do, not from i got to do this to be right, but I understand that this is how He asked me to live, to live abundantly. When I submit myself to the things of God, the aroma that begins to flow for me is a sweet-smelling aroma. When I, and I attract, when I'm talking about things coming to me, it's because I attract those things because of the kingdom that I'm operating out of. When I decide that God's ways are not that good, that really it's more fun to go party and have a good time, I literally submit myself to the Lord of the flies. And what is flies attracted to? It's dung. Right? Cow poop, or dog poop and brownies. <laughs> so what do I attract into my life? Right? This isn't about my relationship with God. This is about where the enemy is still roaming around like a lion looking for he, who he's going to devour. Right? What smell is coming out of my life? Right? What kingdom am I operating out of? Listen, you might be sitting there going, I didn't plan on coming to church this morning to be convicted. I'm not trying to convict you. Right? I love you. I, 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 I just know that God's got me in this place of right now of healing. But you know why I know that God's got me here? Because I'm going through it. Right? I'm experiencing it. I'm going through this experience right now of healing in my soul so that I'm not controlled by jealousy, by bitterness, by uh, any of these emotions that come out from a wound in my soul. And God's revealing to me right now that... When I can begin to be healed and be restored, this is what it means that I'll prosper in all things. When my soul is restored, I'll prosper in everything in my life. Amen. Right? I, I, I'm not coming today preaching a message about sin so that you can leave here feeling guilty. I'm coming to preach a message about sin saying, hey, it's not affecting your relationship with God, but it is going to affect your walk on this earth. Andrew, actually Cecil sent this to me today because he saw my post about what I was preaching on. Andrew says this all the time. If you want to play in the devil's playground, he'll eat your lunch and pop the back. Right? Don't open yourself up to these things. Right? This is not about working hard. Don't leave here saying, okay, I've got to work hard, I've got to work hard. No, this is about resting and trusting God to help you. Amen. Right? Submitting to His authority. Hey, Lord, if, I, if I'm doing something wrong, show me. Lead me. Guide me. I want to do it how you would do it because I know that real victory in my life and my finances and my health and all things in my family is only going to come when I submit to your kingdom. And I'm under the king's domain. Hallelujah. And you know, when we're, the deal is, is when we're in His kingdom, and even when we're going through trials and tribulations, when we stay focused on the principles that God has given us, 
God's, he's going to shine forth to us no matter what, but there's, there is just something about when we are in the supernatural, when the wisdom of God is manifested to the church, that things just happen the way they do because God has created it that way. Does that make sense? I hope so. Thank you. Hallelujah. We're going to stay on authority for a few weeks because I want... This church, I love, I'm going to start recording these. Uh, some of the things I'm saying might offend some people that you're right with God inside your efforts, but that's okay. I'm at a place in my life where I can take the criticism. I can take the, I can take the accusations. I don't, I don't really care right now. I want to record these because I know there's individuals out there that have understood the finished work of the cross. They have understood that I'm forgiven. I'm made right with God. My favor doesn't come from what I do. My favor comes from what Jesus did. They begin to understand these things, but they still are not seeing victory in their life. Right? And I want to see victory in the church. We talk about we want to have a, a revival and all those things. You know, we want to outpour the last great awakening. And I'm all for all those things. But if we don't change the way we think, if we don't change the way we operate, an outpouring, this is why they last for like three years and they go away. All right? And now God never manifested himself in any building somewhere in Zuzu Street so that it could die away. Everything was manifested so that, listen, if the Lord graces us by magnifying his presence in this place, I don't want it to be a three year thing. I want to be able to take the torch to the next generation that comes up below us and say, here you go. Take it. Run with it. Right? Amen. Because God is not interested in doing a three-year thing. He's interested in His heaven invading this place. But if we continue with thinking, thinking about ourselves or how to operate or what God's problem with sin is, we're going to continue defeated, complacent, and not seeing the fullness of everything Amen. His promised in His Word. All right. Hallelujah. Uh, you want to play for just a second? I'm, I'm just going to say a prayer. And, and I really believe God's got me in a place. Uh, you know, any, I don't want to say it that way. I believe that right now that there is favor for healing in this church. I, I, I believe that for the last two or three weeks. That's why I keep speaking about it. I believe it's all the time. But I just feel in my spirit that God has been putting on my heart that to ask for physical healing in this place. If somebody needs a physical healing, to, to speak this out. And so I, I want to say one thing about this. Is you don't need a minister to lay hands on you. Okay? This has been, you receive your healing by faith through grace. It's, it's nothing you do. You just take the, the healing that Christ has already paid for that manifest. But the Apostle Paul, when he... When they didn't have the Holy Spirit, he said, he said, you don't have the Holy Spirit, he laid hands on them so that the impartation of the Spirit from him to them enhanced their faith so they could begin to manifest what God had given them. So I encourage you before we leave, if somebody in here has bad backs, bad knees, uh, sickness, infection, uh, don't leave here with that in your body. That he paid the price for it. It's already been given. If we stand on faith, that, uh, that, he's, that it's ours. You know, faith is, is this. The essence of faith is trust. And when, when I began to just trust Papa, that he, he's going to heal me, not because of I'm good, but because he's good. Uh, it's not something that I go to the throne for every day and beg, but I just begin to receive and begin to see that manifest in my life. Hallelujah. I'm going to let him play a song, and if God puts it on your heart, hey, young man, would you mind uh, coming and praying with me? Is it okay? Is it okay? Is it okay? You just got filled with the Holy Spirit from if you're 